Okay, welcome to uh, Drupal NYC meetup. Uh, I always like respecting people's timeliness and starting pretty close to when uh, we're supposed to start. Um, so some housekeeping things. Um, I'm going to put my cell phone on silent. You might do the same, uh, unless you like being that person who the whole room looks at when your phone rings. Um, also, when we are asking questions, we ask people to use a microphone because we record these sessions and they eventually make their way to YouTube. And we'd like the question to be on there along with the answer. Um, so uh, restrooms are at the back of the room uh, in the corners. And uh, it, if you arrived today at, at Mongo's uh, space before 6 p.m., uh, we'd like to ask you next time when you come back, um, please arrive after 6 p.m. It makes it easier for our host. Um, and that's the request, and we'll be grateful for that. So uh, we have our standard agenda. Um, uh, yeah, there's an after party at House of Brews uh, on 51st Street. And uh, that's not an official part of the meetup, but many people will go there, and you're invited to join for that. Um, so tonight's agenda, uh, first of all, I'm Sean Duncan. Uh, Alex uh, Bleen, our deputy chair, is usually standing in this spot. He's far more like the late night talk show host kind of person. Um, than I am, uh, but he couldn't be here this month, um, so I'm standing in for him to MC. Uh, uh, we had two speakers lined up for tonight. Um, we had Joe Bahana, um, and we had another speaker who, uh, late in the game, as in like yesterday, uh, his schedule changed, and he wasn't able to make it. So what we're going to do is, um, uh, after Joe's talk, uh, we're essentially going to unconference or this space or have some some breakout groups around community-generated uh, questions or topics. So if there's something you'd like to know or something you'd like to talk about, um, I encourage you to start thinking about it now, because after Joe's talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surface suggestions of things that people would like to talk about. And depending upon the number, we may winnow that down to a smaller amount. And then we'll just um, break out here in the room and have, uh, and have some smaller groups. So these are your organizers. Um, we're very grateful to all the people that organized this meetup um, and make it happen. Um, I'm Sean Duncan. I am the chair of Drupal NYC, the nonprofit. And uh, so uh, I support the work of all these people, but I'm not typically organizing the meetup, but more the bigger picture. We're very grateful to MongoDB. Um, MongoDB is providing us this space. And as you know, as New Yorkers, um, there's nothing harder to find in New York than space. Um, so we're very grateful for that. Uh, and our food and drinks tonight are sponsored by, graciously by Pantheon, who's our other sponsor. Um, you can find us on Twitter. We have a Slack. Um, it's a free Slack, so after 10,000 messages, the messages just start to scroll off. So it doesn't have a long history. Um, but it's a great price for us, and you can join that um, uh, at drupal.nyc.slack. Um, we like it when you take pictures. We like it when you tweet them. Um, if you do, please use a hashtag. Um, we are, ours is uh, hashtag DrupalNYC. Uh, also, please share them on the Meetup page. Also, uh, Please join the Drupal Association. Uh, it's not very expensive for individuals. Uh, and uh, all the money the Drupal Association raises is used for Drupal.org, which we wouldn't be Drupalists without, without the support of all the tooling at Drupal.org. Uh, and uh, they also put on the, Drupalcon, the DrupalCon, which is their primary fundraiser. Um, and we're very grateful for the Drupal Association. So there's some upcoming Drupal events. Uh, if you find yourself in Michigan or in, or in California, there's uh, camps coming up. There's a camp in Atlanta. That's a little closer. Um, Cornell's having a camp up in Ithaca next, next month, um, as is Baltimore. Those are a little closer driving distance. And there's a volunteer who maintains a calendar called drupacal.com. And you can find uh, listings of upcoming events at Drupacal.
So we love having speakers. We love having first time speakers. So if there's something you recently learned how to do in Drupal, you don't have to have been doing this for 10 years. But if you recently figured out some, how to do something in Drupal, make it into a talk. Um, let us know. Go to drupal.nyc slash suggest if there's uh, some topic you'd like to hear by. It didn't make it onto the slide because JD uh, just recently put it together. Um, but there is an email address that we've also established. Well, is that speakers or speak? Uh, speak at drupalnyc.org. Yeah. Drupal 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 Send us an email. Speak at drupalnyc.org. Drupal Drupal uh, what's next up here? Oh, before we do that, um, one other thing that you can do um, is we, as we discussed last month, we've recently reorganized under a nonprofit structure, and we're preparing or looking forward to restarting Drupal Camp now that we have a corporation that can sign contracts. So the board of Drupal NYC is accepting applications for a camp lead. So if you have skill at or experience and passion for organizing events, and you would be willing to lead the organizing of the next Drupal Camp NYC, um, speak to me or Holing um, or Chris um, uh, or uh, Scott. Where is he? There, over the, Scott? Um, me? Yes. Yeah. So, Joe, you did it for how many years? A lot of years. Joe did it for a lot of years. So, whoever, whoever we recruit, uh, whoever we appoint, uh, to run the next camp, we'll have Joe as a mentor, just not the primary doer. Um, so let us know. Who's hiring? Anybody hiring? Okay, then I won't ask who's looking because no one tonight here is hiring. This is evidence that Drupalists are water soluble. Uh, so we're all, we're about at least about thirty percent strength tonight from from the signups. Okay, take five minutes to introduce yourself to someone new. If you're sitting next to somebody you know, move around. It's time for our primary talk of the evening. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Joe Bahana, who as we said before, uh, was the principal organizer of Drupal Camp NYC for a number of years, in which context I think I first met Joe working on camp. Um, Joe also has, uh, until very recently, been a Drupal agency owner um, here in New York City and for a long time. And uh, he has some wisdom to share with all of us. Um, and also we'll be recording it as a gift to the community. Joe. All right, so my name is Joe, Joe Bahana, and I've been, um, I've been doing uh, work with Drupal since uh, 2007. In fact, um, one of the first projects I ever did with Drupal was in this building. Actually, Ra Raul, I didn't know was coming here tonight, was, uh, was on that project. We did a Drupal 5 project here for a company called, or uh, several, for a company called Hachette Filipaki Media. US it was really one of the first companies um, to adopt uh, Drupal in the media space uh, in the US. In fact, at the time, the, the big open source project was called Krang. Krang, yes, from the Simpsons. The Krang, and uh, it, it was being used at Prime Media, it was being used at Hearst, it was being used at a, a bunch of different, and you know, folks said, this is, the, this is the project that's gonna take off, and there was something about the Krang the way it was engineered that our team felt wasn't, it wasn't going to work out. Uh, the other thing was that there was a guy who worked here who was the, the global CTO who said Drupal will never make it. What's going to be uh, embraced globally is easy publish. He was absolutely convinced that easy publish was going to be the de facto standard for open source CMS back in 2007. So I won't mention the guy's name. So, uh, well, the purpose of this uh, presentation is to talk to you a little bit about, actually it was suggested to me by a guy named Joe Wikes over at Acquia, who I've known for many years. I knew him before he was at Acquia at a place called uh, 
uh, rhythmics. They made a product called Percussion, which was the Lotus Notes-based CMS a thousand years ago. But he said, you know, it's a really good idea for you to present what you just did with your company, which was essentially sell my interest in the, uh, in the, uh, the development and implementation arm of uh, a DPCI. I've been wanting to do it for a long time. And there's a bunch of, uh, of agencies that have been wanting to do this too. I actually was speaking to Matt Westgate of Lullabot about it, find out what he did. I was speaking with uh, Matt Cheney over at Chapter 3, uh, which is also a shop that he owned. He's actually uh, a principal owner of Pantheon right now. The guy also owns a bike shop, little known. So he's a serial entrepreneur. I think he owned that when he was like eight. So Matt is a very interesting uh, character. Um, so just to kind of start out, why, why did I start DPCI? Uh, so I was working in, um, I, you know, I'm an accidental tech. I don't know who, how many of you are, but I grew up as a classical pianist. I did well in school. I went to Brown University. My father was in technology in the 70s and 80s, and I grew up with computers all around the house, and I worked my summers and my winters uh, for his company and then at ad agencies. Uh, but I wanted to be a pianist. And the thing is, you don't really necessarily make uh, a living playing piano, but what I did was I'd play piano at night when I was... Um, you know, I do gigs in college, and then after college, when I came to New York, I was working at ad agencies, and then I do shows, then I got a job at the New York Times, and a job at the Associated Press. So through that, those years, I became an expert in publishing technology, and so publishing technology to me meant um, creating, managing, back then still enriching or semantically enriching the content, and then delivering it. And delivering it meant something different as the years evolved. Something blew my mind in 1991 or 92. I was speak, I was at a big company presentation at the New York Times where the publisher, Arthur Ock Sulzberger Sr. said, someday people are going to be reading the news, 1991, where they're going to just be scrolling down from their eye, uh, eyeglasses. And people were laughing. They kind of laughed. And he said, you laugh now, but it's going to, it's going to come someday. Uh, so, and I was, I was mesmerized by that concept. You know, the other thing I was uh, mesmerized by was the way, the machinations we had to go through at the New York Times to get the paper published. I worked on the night side in the tech group and it was that, was that called Con Air or whatever, where that guy takes the straw and like saves the day, Oliver or whatever the actor, I don't know if anybody remembers that film, but you had to get the paper out no matter what. If it was 9.30 and there was a technical issue with any aspect of the system, the uh, uh, union guys with the trucks would be honking, and you could hear it all the way on 43rd Street, all the way uptown. It was just, it was a blare of, uh, of honking because they had to deliver it to their route, routes. We printed the paper on 43rd Street. There was also a plant in uh, other parts of the country. We did it by satellite over to Walnut Creek. It was a very sophisticated application uh, or environment that was very uh, tenuous. But so it was a great experience. I got to learn uh, publishing workflows, how content was curated, how images went through workflows. It was fascinating. From there, I worked at the Associated Press. So my, basically, my, my formative years in technology were working with people who actually made these publications, not only at the Times, but the Associated Press was traveling around the country. I got to see publications around the world. I got to see uh, El Sol, which was one of the first publications that was printed or was created in all Mac in Madrid. The week that I went there, I was sent there to do an analysis of what they did. They were closing the paper, which was really weird because I was a kid in my 20s, mid-20s, and, uh, and doing this. Uh, I'm digressing a lot. I'm going to keep moving. Well, the reason why I started DPCI was what, what's up there was that I got, I was started to work in consulting, and I was working like 18 hours a day. I was getting ground to a pulp. I was working at first one company, I was getting promised with promotions or whatever, but they just had me working long hours. Then I was working at another company called Inacom, which was like a $2 billion company that was buying all these agencies in the late 90s. And they were rolling them up. And they just didn't know anything about, like people were running oral sales guys and they didn't know what we were doing in terms of the technologies. And so they closed their, their business uh, March 27th, 1999. And they brought everybody in and said, you're all laid off three days to clear your, four days to clear your desks. Me and this guy, Michael Guerra, were t because we were PMPs, project management professionals, and we were like leaders in our groups, were told we could stay for 30 days, and we were given a certain amount of money to basically help people get organized with things like Cobra, things like I didn't even know. 
But we, because we were conce conceived as leaders in the New York City office, we were given that. I took that money and I started DPCI on April 27th of 1999 because I figured I don't want to work for anybody else ever again. And so what happened was I was working out of my living room. I had uh, people like walking around my apartment like without their, their shoes on, like just, it was just, there were developers like in corners of my apartment doing stuff. And it was really, it was weird. So, uh, but it was also great. I had like friends that I had worked with over the years that were helping me at the time. So what was the focus? The thing I loved when I was um, first, I, I got a chance to write um, a program at the New York Times. It was a simple thing. Uh, I wrote it actually in conjunction with my father because he was a developer. He just passed. So it was a nice memory that just popped into my head because uh, I wrote it with him and a guy named Gary Casamini, who was a um, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, photojournalist, but he was also a programmer. We wrote this thing which we called an envelope program. The idea was to take ads or photos and be able to send them attaching a ticket to them, like just metadata, basically what we can call today embedded metadata, but it was well before any of that was even technically possible. And we got it, it was buggy, there was issues, but it was working. We actually got it into production and we were getting things like ads and other materials through, I think it was like a 14.4, 28.8, or you know, it might've been an ISDN line. We were getting the data in. But so what I loved the idea was uh, being able to manage images, manage it, uh, text all digitally, being able to do things called versioning. The New York Times had zoning issues where they would have to uh, publish different stories in different areas. Um, the other thing I noticed is movie uh, ads had to have different, um, they were, were kind of created differently for movie times or, or locations. Uh, or you, know, you could see like an ad for something, it would say jump off into savings and in one, area, it might have like a swimming pool, somebody diving, and another one, it might be somebody jumping off a ski slope. So this concept of versioning, which was back in the 80s, sorry, in the, in the late, in the early 90s was called database publishing. So the concept of centralizing content into one location uh, and publishing it to multiple channels in a versioned way. So the focus for me was content technologies, which included content management, digital asset management, which was imagery or uh, soon video, um, and then versioning tools or, or these black box tools would let you drive content to things like Quark Express or later on Adobe websites. Very early on we did projects where we were just generating .wap or WML files for the early uh, mobile phone applications. So the technologies we were implementing back in the late 90s, whew, uh, there was a product called North Plains Telescope, which was a digital asset management system. There was a product called Luminous Media Manager, digital asset management. There was uh, CMSs. One was called Broad Vision. Uh, one was called um, Vignette. Uh, we were doing a lot of work with we were doing a lot of work with Microsoft technologies at the start. First ASP, it was classic ASP at the time, with SQL, whatever, it, it got 2001, or I don't even remember what, what version, but it was back then, and then, you know, the .NET thing came out like 2001, 2002, you had the Microsoft CMS. So that's where we were in the late 90s and, and early, that was the technology we had. Uh, the ownership structure, I incorporated it uh, and, and did it myself. I didn't have partners. Uh, later on, I brought in a couple of people and gave them an equity position, and we'll see, you'll see how that turned out. Uh, at this point, but for better or worse, I did it myself. So when I say I'm for better, you know, I can make decisions on my own and I could kind of pivot the company whenever I wanted. But for worse, if you ever got into a point where there was a, something really stressful, you turn to your left to your right, a lot of times people are like, you got to make that decision. So if you ever decide to start your own agency, just think about that. Um, this was the first website. It was a flash site. So yeah, that we, we were, it was actually pretty sweet, but I found this on the Wayback uh, Machine uh, in the web archive the other day. I was looking around at some of the other pages and, uh, you know, it, we were really focusing on magazine, newspaper, book publishers, and then also folks that were doing catalog, direct mail, automation. Um, and it was a great market. Um, so oh, kind of a second chapter. The, uh, the company in 2001, a company I'd worked with called Image Inc., the owner passed away. And uh, they had quite a number of people that were working there. One was named Tracy Gardner, who became our VP of Client Services. So she and I had worked together back in the 90s there. So he died. 
Uh, we ended up with over 20 people and staff. We had a couple of states, project going on all around the country. There was a great uh, initiative or there was an impetus with the sales guys. We've got to hire more people. We'll hire more people. Uh, Quark at the time was kind of jumping the shark and we were moving to more Ad uh, Adobe technologies. We were doing work with Documentum. Uh, Documentum was getting very aggressive with us. We went from doing great work with Documentum to one day they called us and said, here's how, how it's going to go. From now on, you, don't, you can't go directly anymore. You have to go through us. You have to do professional services. Here's what you could charge. Here's what we're going to charge. And we get to break up your teams. Uh, you know, we were spending a lot of time with our Microsoft partnership. It was taking a huge amount of time going, becoming a gold partner and going up. The, 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 it was sort of like uh, practically a, to hire a full-time partner manager to work with Microsoft. We were getting a like, lot of Microsoft development, but it was, it was onerous. It was a lot of work. And, you know, the question came into my mind is, what are we growing to become? I had my second child. My wife and I had our second child in um, 2005, six. I was barely seeing her. I was traveling all the time. I'd gained 60 pounds, 70 pounds. I was, I was really big. Not only was I working there, but I was working here at Hachette. It's kind of as their, their interim CTO. For a period of about a year, I was working in this building 20, 30 hours a week, along with my other uh, job at DPCI as the CEO. Uh, I loved working here, but it was, it was really stressful. And what was happening is my, my family and life was not going great. Uh, there was a lot of tension. You know, my wife was, we were happy that things were going well professionally, but it wasn't going well for the family. And, and that hit me uh, home. You know, that, that's not, I'm not necessarily a motivated, money motivated person. You know, if remember I told you again, at the end of the day, I'm a, I'm a pianist and I still love playing piano and things matter to me more than uh, acquisition of things. So I also became very disillusioned with proprietary vendors at that time. We kept, felt like we were getting bullied. Not all of them, but a lot of times they would say, you know, like we'd need something, uh, just a simple thing like integration of um, two different technologies. And one of the vendors would say, yeah, they're going to have to pay for the, uh, the APIs for the, for the SDK. It's like, you know, it was just, it was really maddening or there's, you know, just obfuscation of, of calls. It was uh, changing of price models or going around us on deals. So we became very disillusioned with proprietary vendors. Um, we moved by 2005, six, we'd already moved to P PHP MySQL, custom CMS development. We built our own website, the next one in, in PHP Smarty templates. We started doing it with, for all our customers, which was cool because we were building great stuff, except we weren't reusing the work from client to client. So what happened was we were managing it for one place and then managing it for another. We we're using different uh, similar methods but it became really untenable. So by 06, we realized we got to get behind uh, an open source project here. Um, and so we did an, about a six month, nine month initiative where we started to look for an open source CMS project. And we did it like kind of like our own internal RFP. I, I led that R&D initiative. We looked at WordPress, we looked at Easy Publish, we looked at Drupal, we looked at Joomla uh, and a couple of other solutions. And we decided on Drupal. I felt like we still, we did a couple of other tester projects over the year or two with these other technologies, but Drupal was a fit for us. Anybody who was working in Drupal 5 at the time knows it was really painful. Um, Drupal 6 was less painful, but you know, and we didn't know what we were doing. So we kind of knew what we were doing, but you know, all this came from like this Microsoft, like some of these guys were that were on the team were, you know, CS masters. And so like they were like used to object oriented pro oriented programming and they're like, what is this procedural code? Like they didn't, they didn't get what we were doing. So it was a struggle for a few years, but we went that route. We also searched for an open source dam project. We looked again at different products out there. We liked resource space, but you know, they weren't really getting their market saturation here. And so we, we really partnered with the folks in the uh, intermedia open source dam project. Uh, and it was a really, it's been a great, it's been a learning curve for, for them as well as us. But it's a really great tiny community. The damn open source community would welcome you with open arms. There's a huge amount of opportunity, and there's not enough people uh, in it. There's, it's a huge upside. So when we started to do is we started to integrate these technologies. So we put like we put Embridge out there, which was this connector between um, Intermedia and, uh, and Drupal. It's up on D.O. We integrated 
there was this proprietary platform called uh, K4, which we still uh, implement, which is editorial workflow. We connected that with Drupal. We started to do a lot of work with connecting InDesign and InCopy directly with Drupal uh, and Word directly with Drupal and OpenOffice. So we started to spend a lot of money in R&D on that. We started running into issues of proprietary licensing uh, against uh, you know, GNU GPL, and so we abandoned it. it we also got in over our heads, because we weren't a product company at the end of the day. We were a professional services shop. It was kind of an exciting time, because we'd also built this thing called Digital Flywheel, which was this automation engine that could generate just about any kind of publication or allow you to just drag and drop articles and images onto InDesign layouts right through a browser session. We sold that as a product for a few years, uh, from 05 to about 011, 012, uh, about 2011, 2012. Uh, and we even connected it with Drupal. Uh, and that was a really cool time for us. But again, we kind of ran into the product company versus uh, professional services. Um, we rebranded at the time. We formed new partnerships in this era. Um, in about 2008, I st attempted to sell DPCI. Uh, a large global agency came to us and they offered us a, a really credible uh, price. And we went through the process and then September came, we got a call from the global CFO that said the credit markets have frozen because anybody remembers what happened in 2008, we didn't get to sell the business. So I was walking around and a, few other, a lot of others were walking around like zombies. Best thing that ever happened because we made some good money after that. In professional services, for us, whereas a lot of the market was corrected in 2008 and nine. We didn't because we had long-term contracts. We had a few years worth of projects uh, that, that sustained us through that period. Um, so I changed in 2012, my third kid was born, my son. And you know, I kind of said, you know, I'm gonna turn this, this is gonna be a quality of life business. You know, I remember talking to, to Joe, your brother Mike about it, you know, and, and other people who were friends of mine in the industry I talked to you. We we went and ran one one day um, out in uh, in uh, in Princeton. And we over the years, I've talked to people in the community that to me, I made a conscious decision. I didn't care about growing the business. I cared about doing good quality work. Uh, me becoming more of a chief consultant, getting back to doing the work, versus uh, worrying about payroll, insurance, sales, marketing, ops, and all that. Um, I transitioned uh, development and implementation to uh, core management at this time. There was a lot of growing pains with that, but it was basically people who'd been there for a while. Some people didn't feel comfortable. Some people took to it really well. A few people didn't. Not everybody's meant to be a manager. You need to put people in situations and, you know, but so, a couple of people rose to that occasion. Uh, uh, the other thing that we did was we implemented workflows and supporting technology through these years and continuously. We did it the first 10, 12, 13 years, but boy, did this hurt. And anybody who's gone through this, like to put in real developer workflows and the supporting technologies, and to do this right is, is one of the hardest things uh, an organization, because also developers don't agree on how it should be done. So trying to get consensus, you can't necessarily do it like it's Mussolini. You have to kind of figure out like, what's the best way for people to work together? You know, the other thing is if you work with partner companies that have their own methodologies, you know, you have to be nimble enough to work with them if they're, uh, if they're bringing you in on a lot of stuff. So this chapter that we're in, uh, we went out and we broadened our, our dossier of, of technologies. Uh, you know, for me, I think digital asset management has a certain uh, purview, but you know, this notion of open, open records or document management, I looked at what was in the market with Alfresco and Nuxio, their price points were, way out there. Even though they're labeled as um, open source projects, they're really, really pricey. So we were looking and did the same kind of RFP process internally, and we did an internal review, and we came up on OpenKM. It's a really solid player that is really well-priced, conducts itself uh, like an open source project. Uh, and then Civi CRM is no stranger to the Drupal community. Civi and Drupal are like that. There was like some weirdness that went on, you know, five to eight, over five to eight years ago that the Civi community still remembers. So a lot of people still kind of push, uh, they push their customers to WordPress. But Civi is still a beautiful uh, open source alternative 
that works really well with Drupal for, for um, CRM. And so this is something that we brought in. Um, I increased strategic consulting, which was chief strategy officer, uh, chief technology officer types of consulting. A lot of companies uh, need that kind of service. Uh, there's a real gap in most companies. Also continuing to tool up the team, meaning just getting them the resources they needed to be successful, um, uh, whatever you, you know that means, and then continuing to refine workflows and solidifying and developing partnerships. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about partnerships as a lesson learned in a bit. Finally, the concept of fully empowering management. I got a couple of tips from people named Matt Cheney I mentioned before, and Matt Westgate, but Cheney was the best. Matt just said, because I was talking to him a few years ago at a DrupalCon about my intention to sell the business and wanting to sell it to my employees. He said, just disappear. I was like, what? What are you kidding? They're going to make mistakes. They're going to screw things up. They're going to be upset. He's like, no, just don't show up. First, start for a few days. Then don't show up for a week or two. You know, or if they ask you something, say, you got this. Just do it. Well, what would you do? I was like, Matt, is that, that's the way he thinks. Like, if you've never met him, he, he gave me really good advice. It was scary at first. But I did that over, over a couple of years, uh, and it was great advice. And yeah, I helped them out. In serious problems, I stepped in and, and gave them coaching. Um, but this was really the most important thing, the most important step in terms of transitioning the agency so that people could think they could run it. Because uh, So what happened was, here's what I came to these guys in the beginning of the year, and I said, um, OK, guys, here's the options. I, I've been talking about this for a few years, I'm either going to wind the business down or I'm going to sell it to a larger entity. Here's your chance. I said, how come you, some of you have been here for 18 out of the 20 years? What's kept you here? I said, well, we love working together. We love the, the, the culture. We love working with Drupal. Drupal. We love inter, in, implementation work. I said, here's your chance to do, to take that, like that story in The Princess Bride where it's like the next Dread Pirate Scott. Is that who it is? Or, see, I'm doing all these references. Dread Pirate Roberts, thank you. Somebody's got the cultural reference. But so the idea is to pass the keys to somebody else to run it. And so we talked about how to structure it rather than buying the business. DPCI was never a very flattering name. I named it. You know, you saw from the early slide, I made, I made that logo too. Um, but so they wanted something a little more catchy and they wanted to sort of restructure it. So what happened was we did a um, what's called a... Um, a sale of the book of business. And so what happens is they buy uh, the business or all the, the assets um, and, and relationships and everything. Um, and what I get to keep is my consulting work. So because they didn't want to do that, you know, the strategic kind of uh, CTO type of work is uh, is what I love, and and that's what I want to focus on. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about top ten ten lessons learned. Then I'll take questions. Uh, there's probably a lot more lessons, but uh, set up a partnership magic quadrant for yourself. Go after those relationships with those companies. I might create something and just open source it and throw it out there for people. Because like a magic quadrant, for me, I was banging my head, spending a lot of money and a lot of time partnering with companies that were just wasting my time. Partnerships are not just software companies like a MongoDB or a Pantheon, or it could be other agencies. There was a period of time where DPCI had a partnership, a relationship with a company called Treehouse Agency. Now, Treehouse Agency was an agency just like DPCI. But when we had too much work, we would refer them clients. When they uh, had too much work, they'd refer us. And you know, sometimes we'd win like a $150,000, $200,000 project from those referrals. We continued it when Treehouse was bought by phase two, but it became more of a one-way thing. We were just sending stuff to them, and it never really came back. Even as recently as last year, we sent them uh, a really compelling uh, government RFP. So, but you know, a lot of times we just did referrals because if we couldn't handle a certain kind of contract and we knew it would be a good fit with somebody else, that was just our way of, of doing it. But partnerships, um, setting it up in terms of the, the, the parameters of what makes a best partner for your organization is a really great analytical thing you could do over a couple of hours with people in your organization. And when you pick those three to five, you spend a lot of time finding out what it is they need and want. Um, it's an incredible endeavor. Nurturing those relationships will grease the wheels of your company for years. 
I could tell you so much of our revenue, we never spent a lot on salespeople because we didn't need it, but some of it was just through referrals, referrals from existing clients, referrals from partners. Uh, next, uh, get very specific about the problems you solve for what kinds of businesses. A lot of agencies are just too horizontal. They say, yeah, we could do this. Yeah, we could do this. We could solve everything um, for any market, for pharmaceutical, for government, for education, for mar marketing. No, I think that for, for me, like when I get on the, when I was getting on the phone and talking with clients, I would be able to say, you know, we're helping with these kinds of problems for companies that are publishing content to print, web, and mobile. So there were very few agencies in the world that know how to connect digital asset management with content management with editorial workflow. And that's where we stuck. So in companies that were looking, they sent us an RFP that didn't fit within it, wasn't gonna be a good fit. So we weren't gonna spend too much time on those. So try to get specific about what you wanna do. Uh, ask questions. People don't wanna hear how great you think you are. Even if you're the best agency, because I still see agencies that say we're the number one, we're the leading da 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 in the, in the, the planet Earth. Uh, we're the number one. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares. All people care about is their own pain, their own problems, going in immediately and sitting down. And I can always tell if somebody's going to be a customer or not when I sit down and I start talking with them about what problems. And if they say, I don't know, let me get the person, and that person comes in the room, and then all of a sudden we're having a substantive conversation. A lot of times I could say, I can't solve that, but I know the guy who can. Or I think I know, or no, I can't but get to the questions right away, and then you get to know a lot more quickly. Don't brag, nobody cares. I think that probably holds true in dating as well, but I've been out uh, of that for a long time, so. Um, go where they ain't. I can't tell you the number of times I see people clustering uh, at DrupalCon around the five uh, businesses that showed up looking for a possible Drupal shop. Do you realize that if you are opening an agency, there are places that don't even know the word Drupal. They don't even know the words content management or customer experience management. They, they couldn't keep up because what happens is the acronyms keep getting uh, created by you know, the, the, the gold rushers uh, in, in content marketing. But the concept is, is go after for, for your agency where other agencies are not. If you keep going to the ball, it's gonna be like kids playing soccer, five, six, seven years old, where they're just running after the ball. Go where they ain't. Uh, I said this before, invest in the workflows and tools, keep working on them. Get a trusted leader at the company to do it to save you time so you're not doing it, but that person has to be deputized, spend the money, get this right. It continually changes, it improves, but I can tell you from the yield of the productivity that I saw as we kept improving our workflows, we kept on putting in new tools, we became so much more effective uh, as an organization. Uh, and you can also assess whether people can perform really well if they know how to operate within that, that tool set. Um, establish your company's culture and mean it. So the key is writing values. A lot of people just put values up on their website and then they forget about them. You know, it doesn't matter what you, you say your culture is or what your values are. Just make sure that you live them and that your every single team member lives them and that you hire for those cultural, those values. Because if you hire outside it, you will never be happy. Some of this was a mistake or for mistakes I made because there were periods of years where I was really working hard on the values and culture. And then I dropped the ball a little bit on that. I got a little lax and we just were hiring people because they had the name Drupal on their resume on Indeed or LinkedIn. That was a mistake. You got to hire for culture. Uh, you know, we're not a company that is gonna attract people that wanna go party um, after work with their, their colleagues. People are gonna go home, they wanna go to their families or whatever. You know, I had a hard time getting people coming here. Uh, people who worked at my company, the culture somehow came that, that people just wanna go home to their uh, New Jersey or Brooklyn or whatever, be with their families they didn't want to come out to the meetups. So whatever your culture is, this one's a tough one. Uh, anybody who owns uh, a business, underperformers or toxic players, we all keep them too long. Underperformers, I'd say, I was just talking with a friend of mine who runs an, a new business this morning. We had coffee, He's this, and he said that he estimated in the 10 years he ran an agency, he wasted about six to $8 million in uh, rework 
or salaries of people that just couldn't make it and they kept holding on to them, holding on to them, and they keep trying harder. Uh, I have ideas about how to, to tell whether somebody's an underperformer or not, but anybody here who's an engineering lead usually can tell. The flip side of that is toxic players. So uh, I would view myself, one of my greatest flaws, and, and uh, I wouldn't say it's embarrassment, but I'm, I'm, I wasn't proud of the way I was the first eight to 10 years of DPCI. I was a kind of an angry boss. I was constantly lit. I was working 80 hours a week. I'd work 100 hours a week. I'd be working day, night. I'd be doing project work. I'd be doing everything. And I was the arrogant asshole. I was, not to everybody, but if somebody was not performing, I would kind of browbeat them or whatever. And it's just, it's embarrassing to say, but I have to say that I made a deliberate decision like 10 years or so ago that I had to change who I was and how I engaged with people. And I had to be more of a coach and a mentor uh, to folks. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that people who underperform should stay. It just means you have to be kinder. I had to be kinder about it. Um, at least give people a chance and understand, is there something we're doing as a company that's thwarting them? Um, the talented ass is destroying the company. I was for a period of time. I had people who worked you know, uh, in the business over, over the years who were mean, particularly developers, could be very rough on other developers. Uh, I've seen it or I've heard about it. Uh, in projects, it, you should have a zero, zero tolerance for that. And you're, it doesn't matter if the person is the best programmer or developer or architect you've ever met, they got to go. They're corrupting your, uh, your business. Ah, this is an easy one, three to six months of working capital. Don't do shoestring. Things happen. Uh, at one point, I had six to 12 months of working capital in my business because I was so terrified of it going under. I had more and more people working there. That's too high. So there's probably people here that are better in finance than me, but because I never took out any loans, I bootstrapped the business. I wasn't uh, into it for anything other than doing it right. This is a good kind of a, uh, a model for you to live by. Uh, pay your vendors and suppliers immediately. It come, there comes a time where you'll have to call in a favor and you'll, you'll be the first one that they'll say yes. And that has happened over 20 years. A couple of times somebody said, we'll take care of you. Always pay them right away. My dad taught me that one, actually, when I was 16, 17 and organizing rock concerts at the schools. You know, he said, just make sure you pay. And I didn't have no money in my pocket at the end, but I paid the person who did the lighting. I had the person who did the soundboard. Uh, so they always wanted to do my shows. Uh, and then finally, this one is let, it, let people know it's okay to fail, which I didn't. People were afraid to fail at my company the first 10 years. It was, they were terrified of it. And I was afraid of failing. I was like white-knuckling life uh, at the company. But... It is okay. It's just not okay to shirk responsibility. For me to be able to say in front of a room, yeah, I, I, I messed that up. I'm going to make good on that. And I've had people like that. I've had great team members or employees who like said, yeah, we messed that up. Let's, let's fix this. Let's get this right. And telling the customer, we, we, we're going to fix this. We're going to make this right. Uh, it's great. That culture of accountability is probably the most important thing you could do uh, as an agency uh, owner and, uh, and probably any of us in the room. We mess up, we admit it, fix it, move on. Most of the time, people are, are gonna accept that. Uh, so what's next for me? I'm gonna continue strategic consulting. Uh, that, or a lot of, what I've noticed, a lot of companies just don't, so if you come in and you do work for companies, they don't know how to do their requirements. They don't know how, they don't know what year it is. They don't know what Agile is. They don't know why their employees are turning over so quickly. They don't know how to pick technologies or how they snap together or why they have something an Oracle here and this and that. And so for me, this is really, I've been doing this for a number of years. I'm doing it now for companies. I love it. It has a direct impact on companies' success. Like I could see them improving, not only in the way they're implementing, but the way their, their, their staff seems to get less stressed, it becomes less about kind of people and more processes. So this is very gratifying work. Uh, I'm going to continue doing coaching and mentoring. That became a commitment of mine for over the last 10 years, you know, just learning to coach and mentor uh, people coming up, not only in technology, but because I'm also in sports, so I do coaching there, uh, and I like that. Um, and, you know, in the future, I might take a job 
at an organization that's doing interesting work. I don't know. I'm keeping open to it. It's sort of my next chapter. I might be um, glamorizing work. I haven't worked at a, uh, an end user company in, in 20 something, 25 years. So I'm, I am like, I'm part of me like excited, like would be cool to be on the inside instead of always on the outside, like recommending or building, but then going out. So anybody have any questions? The question while while uh, they're setting up the mic was uh, what was the, uh, the the arrangement of the sale? And so we we wanted to go as simply as possible. So the decision was that the employees were going to set up their own corporation, a separate entity. Uh, however, I think they did an LLC, uh, but whatever their structure was based upon what their accountant recommended. Um, and there was just an outright purchase of assets. There was no, they don't own part of DPCI. I don't own part of them. It's two distinct companies. And so what I was left, what I retained is my consulting practice and all the implementation development with long-term customer contracts, current existing scopes of work, all of that went over to them. Uh, I don't, I don't know that they set it up that way, but that I'm not privy to that. I, I, uh, their, their entity is what, uh, purchased the, the assets, uh, from DPCI. So however they structured it, I, I'm not part of their board or, or anything. I think you know, I wasn't trying to like run away right. from them. I'm making myself available to them, but I really wanted them to, st I told them when we met, you guys can stand on your own. You don't need me anymore. And they actually believe me this time, because I told them a couple of years ago they didn't believe me, but this time they believed me. So, other questions? So basically it came to, you negotiated a price and they said yes, you both said yes, and they bought it through whatever their mechanism was that they bought it. Right, right. Okay, thank you. When I listened to your talk, I understand that the process was very gradual. It was really hard to let go because you've been doing this for 20 years. What I miss right now is, is the adrenaline because I, I, I like intellectual challenges and I honestly, for the last month, don't feel, I, although I'm doing consulting work, I, I need more. Like I, I'm a person, whether, I don't know if it's ADHD or whatever it is with me, but I need more and that's, that's definitely missing in my life. But uh, it was a gradual process. It's something I've been kind of grooming them for for a few years. Uh, so with each step along the way, as I felt closer, there was a feeling of relief. Not like, you know, I mean, when I left my space, I had DPCI offices for 18, 19 years. I had a little bit, but I was also kind of happy to like close, like lock it and say, okay, you know, I, now I'm at a WeWork. It's like, and it's okay. But uh, I don't know, I feel, I feel relieved just about not paying like p payroll. It's like this, or things like that, it's like, Wow, I don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> Hi, um, just from listening to your presentation, I do appreciate you had a very cohesive team, but I understand sometimes you're building a business and the driver of the business is sometimes a very key factor in the relationships you have with clients. And I'm wondering if you had some long-term clients who probably had concerns thought you were leaving and how you assuage those concerns before you left. Yeah, that's a really perceptive question. Uh, and there's really actually two aspects to that. Uh, first, we'll talk about the clients. I, part of my stepping away, like what Matt Cheney said, was any new deal that came in over the last couple of years, I, didn't, I wasn't involved in. I didn't go on any of the sales. Like maybe I might've been on short, like the CEOs on the call, but they didn't know who I was. So that was important that the, the relationships were formed by the people who were uh, on the management team. Some of the older relationships, we've had calls recently, like what does that look like? But they also have known us for so many years. Like one customer is, one of my oldest customers, Publishers Clearinghouse, they've been um, a customer for 20 years. They were our, one of our first customers. 
so they had questions, but they also know I'm going to be available. Um, there's, there, there will be collaboration or cooperation. I'm not going away. They also understand, I mean, it was very clear in the press release and the statement I'd made that we're each following our own passions. Uh, the bigger point you made, which was a business does require a driver. A project requires a driver. If you look at what Dries was or Matt Mulling or is or Matt Mullingway, and then look at Joomla, where they kind of lost their, their, their titular or the, the person who was really driving the, uh, the project, it, it holds true in businesses that I am a person who has a lot of energy and I was driving the company forward, always new innovation, always like, that's just my nature. And so the, the question for them will be, can they find that? They're really good technologists. They're really great at what they do. But um, that engine, like you need that in a CEO. Like, and if you don't have that, if you're a really good ops person, you maybe want to get a partner who has that kind of fuel and let them do that so they're the front person and you're doing the, the CTO or COO work. Because uh, it's very hard to fake it. So, Joe. Was that ever a consideration with them when you talked through it um, that you actually looked to potentially find a CEO to replace you Great in the question process? Too. Uh, over the years, I had been hiring young, uh, what I viewed as really talented, what I'd hoped to be mini-me's. And each time, I'd be a few years, they'd be there, and I'd have sit down and have a conversation, say, what would it be like if you eventually became CEO of the company? And most of them didn't want it, which shocked me. I had one guy who was so great. He was so good as a technologist, and he was so great with customers, not because he BSed them, but because he was honest with them, but in a kind way. Like, he didn't make them feel bad about them. So he could sit and say, no, nah, that's not what you want. This is really what you want to do. And I sat down with this young guy. I said, do you want to be, he's like, no effing way do I ever want to do that. My father owned an automotive dealership. I don't want to ever own a business. I saw what it did to him and to my family. I was like, okay, okay, <laughs> okay, I get it. Uh, and it changed the nature of the business because then he felt like, although I never brought it up again, I think he felt the pressure. So, yeah, I tried to find somebody, but... And you can't, I couldn't bring somebody from the outside. I did try that a couple of times. It didn't work because uh, part of it was culture. Part of it was the, it's the, the Drupal thing or the open source. Like people didn't get it. Like they wanted us to do certain things we couldn't, uh, we, we just wouldn't do. So I think we boxed them out. Maybe had I stepped out and gotten a professional CEO or manager and maybe they would have done a much better job and b built the company to a 10 times or a hundred times bigger. This kind of a company if, if the new owners uh, wanted to, could turn it, they could turn it into 20 million, they could make it into a phase two if they want, or FFW or, or whatever they want to do, uh, they could do it because it's got a great platform. Uh, it's just, I didn't have that urge to do it, so. so Joe, you talked about uh, team members who aren't performing or aren't producing at the level that you need them to. Um, and balance that with the cost of hiring um, and and your your coaching and mentoring. Um, how do you know when when it's a matter of of teaching, and when it, it's not? Well, the first thing you've got to do in an organization, I think, is is you have to have people who are open to mentoring and coaching. If that's not part of the culture, then no amount of money you're going to spend in in hiring is going to work. So, so yeah, I'm thinking about it. it's expensive to hire a new employee. So letting somebody go. It is, but before you even hire, hire somebody, if the culture doesn't provide for, for mentoring and coaching, if you don't have that kind of a methodology, then it's not, it's, you're better off working with offshore car partners or those guys in Costa Rica or whatever, just piecemeal it out. Um, if you really want to build your own uh, squad, you have got to have an internal practice for mentoring, coaching, um, you know, we were using like, um, we were having people go through the, uh, the ACRA training tools, the ACRA certification, um, which showed a certain degree of proficiency. The thing is, it's just because somebody carries certification doesn't mean they know how to think th through a problem. Um, so what, what I found is, is that if you've got the culture and if you've got people that are caring and, and good teachers or mentors, and I would view you as, as somebody, although I've never worked with you, we've done enough in the open, in, our collab together, that I know you have that kind of personality. 
that you have to trust that that manager is going to say, I don't think this person's going to make it. I don't think they have the mental alacrity or I don't think they're going to have the problem solving ability. Um, conversely, you should be able to say, you know, I think this person's going to make it, but we really, we may need to spend a little more money and put them through the, the schooling uh, or um, pairing kind of uh, situations. When you look for talent, how do you, how do you determine that during the interviewing process? What, what makes a good candidate? What makes a not, a not so good candidate? Anybody can post All a right. Anybody can go to school. All right. There are better companies that hire than, than we did because our process was, it could be considered onerous or dinosaur-like, but I would, we would have it where somebody would make a call, ask a bunch of questions. Then after that, we would give them a test. So 90% of the people disappeared. 90% of the candidates right away would vanish. You'd have 10% of the people would say, okay, I'm game. They take an online test. Sometimes two tests. When they came in, if they passed the test, the next thing we do is we have them come in. They'd be interviewed by some folks, and then they'd have be given a practical test in a, a lab. People don't like that. Now I don't know if we were right or wrong, but what, what we do is we'd have them solve a problem. And in some cases, Juzer, who was the CTO, it was an insurmountable problem. He didn't care that they solved the problem. He wanted to see how they approached it and how they conduct it. It was like the Kobayashi Maru in Star Trek. He was giving them, and you know, a few people came in and they were brilliant, they gave brilliant, though I can't solve this, but if I could, here's how. And the, he said, we have to hire this person. So he would test, but the process itself would, would eliminate nearly everybody, all our candidates. So we could never grow to a 50, 100 person company. The best we could be was a 10, 15 person shop 15, because we could hire maybe one, two people a year through this process. Everybody else would run for the hills. So I don't know if you should take that. I think you should listen to other business leaders to, to hear how they do it. Because I, I feel like that could have been, you know, it's the way we went. I probably still do it the same way, but I don't know if it's the best way. Uh, to, to just that process is pretty intense, but what was your retention rate once you had that process? How many, like if you're saying you're at a company of 15 on a yearly basis, were you retaining those 15 employees or having, you know, two leave and two come in or, I mean, that's a big thing. Like we had, um, re retention varied based upon what we, we found over the years is that when we hired people who were super bright, maybe a year or two out of college, we'd only have them for about a year to 18 months. Mm -hmm. uh, and that folks were a little longer in the career. We, we'd get two to three years. Some of them gave us eight years. Like we did have some folks that were unusually long in the tech business, but I think the, the, the younger candidates were typically very quick. Uh, and then folks who are a little older would stay two, three years. Um, and I think it was immaterial of the process. What we did find is some people who were game for being tested stayed longer. Like they tend to like challenges anyway. Like they, there were folks that we met that were unusually interested in, in being tested or challenged on projects and things like that. And so those people tend to need to be on challenging uh, kinds of assignments. The comment was as opposed to being threatened. Right, and how so? Threat some people are threatened by puzzles and problems and challenges. Yeah, or tests. They wouldn't come to the... Uh, you know, if you're Jake, you're one of the, 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 I would love to work with you at some point, but if you don't like tests, you probably would have ran out the first day uh, of an interview. I think Raul, we, we might've made you do a test 10, 15 years ago or. Yeah, but so that could be that we were, we could have been eliminating uh, folks that were really talented people that. In order to in order to reduce your turnover rate, what perks do you offer your employees to make them take make them stay? Like uh, again, there are, there are folks that that could do this better, but I had a profit share set up from uh, we had health insurance from 1999 on. We set up the profit share for the company in 2000 2001. So every year we would disperse profit out to the staff. On top of that, we do bonuses. We have education credits. We're doing a lot of that. The problem is is DPCI is not a recognizable name, and when you know we had years where Somebody like MLB would come in or uh, NBCU or companies would come in and they'd hire 50 developers uh, in, in the market. 
uh, and they, you know, it, it was hard to compete. We had um, one year where we were doing work uh, for, for uh, a company and they tried to hire our, our staff away and these are recognizable household names. So uh, our, our benefits, I don't think that's why people stayed. I think they were assumed and they're certainly assumed now. We, we were ahead of the curve in terms of those benefits. I think people stay for the camaraderie, they stay for the coaching, they stay because they want to learn, they want to get better. As far as advancement, it's very hard to sell advancement at a 10, 15 person company. Because if people want to come in and they want to get promoted up and they're looking for that, they're not going to find it at a small agency. So hope that answers your question. I, I don't know that it was about the money. The money could have been could have been it. I think it was more the prestige of like somebody getting hired like in a in a prestigious job at a like a couple of people got hired at Adobe, uh, and you know you couldn't find it. They got put in really interesting spots. So it was like you know you wish people well. They got they they moved on to good. There's not. So I don't, I, it could have been in some cases about money, but people, when I do exit interviews, I didn't often hear it was about money. It was more like opportunity. This is a great opportunity for me. So the, the psychological catchphrase for this is performance anxiety, and that's why people don't want to take a test. You know, it's like they just feel like they they can fail. They you know they're going to come up short, whatever. And it's uh, so it does have a you know it it's a human condition, if you will, from performance anxiety. It's, yeah, I mean, it could have been. It also happens been, in the bedroom, for example. <laughs> it could have been a, a, a flaw in our HR process, and I would I would admit that. But the thing is, is that like most companies, DPC was a reflection of me. You know, who I was like, uh, you know, I can go and get a, an open mic in, in any situation, or just I I'm just a, an extrovert. So like I I was looking for people who could be problem solving, that could get in a room and not feel like intimidated about sharing, or I wanted people who were dynamic. Not to, not to say that that was a good idea or not, it was just my company. I think there are probably companies that do much better in terms of uh, hiring and retention than our company ever did. But you know, we also had people that were working there for 18 out of the 20 years, which you barely ever hear. They're a non-family or non, you know, there was some loyalty there. Well, to, to kind of tack on to that, Joe, and, and to ask a question, um, as you went through the different chapters, it's obvious how the business is you from the time that you started it. It's your baby. It's and you went through lots of different psychological changes yourself at the point when you actually decide that in the middle there that it's going to be a lifestyle business. Was that apparent to the employees? Was that something that change the dynamic for everyone because the dynamic had changed for you at that point? That's a really great question. I think I probably was a little selfish in that regard. For people who were cool with it, that wanted a lifestyle gig, that could work from home or could, you know, like they weren't going to have to feel like they had to work 60, 80 hours a week or weren't going to have to fly to do a country, a project across the country. That was great. We lost people who wanted that they, they wanted to push and they wanted to grow and they wanted to open an office in, Bo office in Boston and Dallas. And we, we definitely lost those people because the culture changed and I didn't make a deliberate dis like statement, this is what we're doing. It kind of just evolved from my heart and I was behaving in a certain way where the people who liked it were like, this is cool. And people who didn't, they got out. Thank you very much, Joe. Yeah, interesting questions, guys. Hopefully that was helpful.